In 2013, I spent six months working for Shen Yun, which is a traveling Chinese ballet company. Their headquarters is in Cudabacville, New York. They are run by, Shen Yun is run by, a religious organization called Falun Gong, Falun Dafa. Li Hongzhi started this religion, uh, I believe in the early 90s or maybe the late 80s. Uh, I was very familiar with this religion because as a condition of membership in the orchestra, you had to practice this discipline, which for the most part is innocuous. It's meditating at various times during the day, doing some exercises, and just having a general moral code that you follow. Nothing uh, really dastardly about it. But they have some interesting beliefs, and I've never really talked about this experience. Um, so Falun Gong is a very well-organized institution. And Li Hongzhi is a very charismatic man. My orchestra manager, I forget her name actually right now, unfortunately, but she uh, had a husband and her son was in the orchestra, but she had a husband that did some job somewhere else, but she lived there um, and traveled with the orchestra. And when Li Hongzhi would speak, the way she looked at him was just like he was God. Because that's what these people believe, that Li Hongzhi is effectively God. He's careful never to explicitly state where he stands in the cosmology that he's invented. But his, the religion is fascinating. It's a mixture of various religious beliefs. They do believe in a creator kind of behind it all, as well as a tripartite materialist framework similar to the philosophy of the three gunas from Hinduism. They believe in Buddhas and, you know, traditionally there are three levels of Buddhahood, the Arhat, the Awakening, and then the Bodhisattva, kind of compassionate being, and then Tathagata, the, that's where you really get to full enlightenment, Nirvana, this sort of thing. And the historical Buddha is supposed to be one in a long line of incarnations of this kind of ascended master archetype. Um, now, Li Hongzhi claims that a Tathagata is like nothing to him. He's so far above this. And he claims to be omniscient. He claims um, to have all these great powers. So their central text, uh, again, I can't remember the name of the text now, but it's some Chinese name. Uh, and so I read this thing like dozens of times because that was part of what you had to do as a member of the organization. They would all sit together and read it out loud. Uh, one paragraph in English and then the next paragraph in Chinese. And I learned just a little bit of Chinese while I was there. I took a class in Chinese from uh, one of the, the other people there with some of the other Westerners that they hire. Um, and it's, it's very strange that, so Shen Yun is free, or at least was back in 2013, I'm not sure about today, but they're free to go to major music schools in this country and put up a little display. And uh, like at Eastman, where I went to school, um, they even, Eastman let them like use one of the rehearsal spaces um, concert venues also sort of to do auditions. So people did auditions at the school. Now I didn't, I was graduated 
and was kind of just figuring out what I was going to do living in Wisconsin. And uh, I got an email from my my horn professor back at Eastman saying, well, Shen Yun is going through Milwaukee and, um, you know, I can get you an interview, basically, or an audition. Um, or he recommended that I, I contact them. I think he knew that I wasn't really on track to be doing anything. I had auditioned for... Um, the music program at University of Wisconsin, Madison, where I was, and I was taking lessons with the horn professor there, and he was a nice enough guy. Uh, I'm sure that would have been fine if I, I took that route, but I went to Milwaukee, I took the audition, and they offered me the job, and I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, but yeah, it's very strange that they're allowed to do this in American music schools, knowing what I know now, they are a cult. Like, they're nice people. I love the people that I met there. I had very good times. And they're all scrupulous uh, to an excess. Very generous, good-natured people. Um, would never do anything, uh, would never steal, would never curse, would never do anything to, to tarnish their... Uh, gong energy, <laughs> which, so, it, you know, it's religious syncretism is the basis of this system, and it's not karma-based exactly. I mean, he does mention karma and chi, but these are subsidiary forces, and primarily you're concerned about your gong column, which is kind of like this virtue energy that builds up from not doing things wrong, basically. And that's the emphasis of his moral system. It's not like Christian altruism. Um, it's more like, don't do anything immoral, don't do anything illegal. So it's a via negativa morality, um, which, you know, it, it's not intrinsically that harmful. What I worry about is how organized and effective these people are. So Li Hongzhu was kicked out of China, um, and supposedly the religion is persecuted in China, and they spread these stories of organ harvesting. So they will take Falun Dafa practitioners um, from China, the Chinese government will, and they'll uh, harvest their organs and sell them on the black market, which it's China, maybe that happens. But knowing what I know about the, the religious beliefs, uh, I'm just extremely skeptical of anything that this organization has to say. So some of the things in the main book, the main, and he has many books that are, he never writes them, he gives speeches. Um, he's a, a brilliant extemporaneous speaker. And he gives speeches and people transcribe these and kind of clean them up a little bit. The main one, for the most part, it's anecdotes about him meeting other supposed masters and then like discovering that they're really demons and describing how he was able to defeat them. And like he claims to be able to fly and just all the shapeshift, all this stuff. Um, and, you know, when... When I saw the ballet for the first time, after they gave me the job, uh, they let me see the ballet before I, you know, played with the orchestra or anything. And so I, uh, I was sitting like th three seats down from Lee Hong Jur, and he was wearing glasses. <laughs> and he's like kind of overweight, and and I guess um, I didn't see this exactly, but he used to play trumpet when he was a kid, and apparently he took out a trumpet and and was going to play, uh, I don't know if he was going to play with the orchestra or just for the orchestra people, and he couldn't, obviously, because he hadn't played in years, and those muscles are very specific. You, it's not something you can just pick back up after any prolonged period of time. So it, it just doesn't, it, <laughs> what I saw from him doesn't match the idea of this person with omniscience and superpowers. But, you know, that's what he claims, and that's the stuff in the main text, which is ridiculous enough, right? Um, and a little bit more on that main text and how he 
portrays the system. I mean, he depicts it as though it's like a science in a sense. It's a wisdom tradition. It's it's actually ancient. It's actually the most ancient thing. And he criticizes Western science because that kind of desensitized uh, Chinese people from their archaic uh, practices, which were actually much more effective. Like Chinese medicine was more effective. And he, he like disparages Western technology saying that, well, in the past, with all these powers from the meditation and from the, you know, enlightened states that people were able to achieve, people could fly around, um, things like that. But yeah, he doesn't argue a system. He just gives a bunch of anecdotes about how he beat people in various circumstances. That's the majority of that book. But he has all sorts of other interesting things uh, to claim about history. So first of all, the Earth is much, much older. Or rather, humanity is much, much older than we think. Millions and millions of years old. And uh, mermaids are real. That's something that I got to learn from him directly. He was on the bus with us at one point, And he got up at the front and took questions. Um, and I, I should have come up with a better question but I asked him, and he doesn't really speak English very well, um, so someone translated for me. But I asked him, like, where, do, where did the creator come from in your system? Which is a typical, like, atheist talking point with theists. And he said, oh, I, I don't know that. Um, and then he went into saying, like, but the, the universe is so big and just <laughs> unrelated stuff that works on his audience. Um, but that's kind of another thing about the system. It's, it's really about following Li Hongzhu is trying to get onto his planet, his world that he governs um, in the next life. Like reincarnation is real and there are countless worlds out there, which I kind of believe as well, but not in this materialistic sense that he does. Um, but like there are world, the atoms in your body, there are worlds there and there are different levels that you, you can incarnate into, um, different like base material that you can be made up of elevated material. And, um, it's, you know, not systematic, but just all these kind of interesting notions floating around in the system. So mermaids are supposed to be real people of all sorts of different colors, not like modern races, but like, you know, green people, red people, um, just a typical um, new age components part of it combined with the most ridiculous stuff I've ever heard and millions of people <laughs> believe in this and uh, he, definitely the most well-known person that I've ever had direct contact with um, besides that question I think I only ever spoke with him once because I think he wanted to try out his English or practice his English. We were, I don't know if it was backstage somewhere, probably backstage somewhere. And uh, he doesn't travel with, uh, and he has three orchestras and, and three ballet companies that are all based out of Cudabacville, New York. Um, but he doesn't follow each orchestra all the time. I think he just pretty much goes where he wants. But I believe we're in San Francisco. Um, when he was there. But anyway, he was backstage and he just said, like, how are you? And, you know, whenever you see him, you're supposed to put your hands together and, and bow and that sort of thing. And you call him, uh, what's the Chinese word for master or teacher? Shufu. You call him Shufu. And, and so I was like, um, Hong Hao Shufu, <laughs> very good uh, teacher. So that was my one little personal interaction. But yeah, people, the people were nice. And um, I'm a little concerned with the level of indoctrination of the children that were there um, because they're brainwashed. And I don't know if, well, in fact, I'm, I'm sure, I'm certain that not all of the adults were brainwashed. Um, the actual day-to-day -day business aspect of it. And he has a media, probably has multiple media outlets um, that broadcast in different areas. Um, 
And a lot of the time, you won't know that it's sponsored by Falun Dafa. It'll, it'll just be propaganda about the Chinese organ harvesting or whatnot. Um, he has... I'm just talking about Li Hongshu and Falun Dafa, and that's what this video is about. Uh, some interesting stuff, and, you know, changed my thinking in a lot of ways. After this experience, so I did get fired, um... And I think I played well enough. The The reason they gave was that I wasn't playing well enough, but I played great during all the concerts. And then um, during the summer when it's the off season, they have, they really just work you to death. It's like 80 hour work weeks, um, including all of the reading the scripture and, and uh, meditating and all that. You get one day off a week with them. Um, but I got fired probably because I started just being too relaxed. So, you know, I would go for runs. It's in the mountains, in the, the Catskills, Cutabackville. And uh, he has a, a great, like, I don't know how many acres it is, probably more than a thousand acres, beautiful complex up there that the architect architecture is like Tong Dynasty era. So kind of the the artsiest kind of Chinese traditional temple architecture, all sorts of statues. Um, there's a lake up there and, and great trails for running. So I would run up there um, and I would just wear an undershirt because I didn't want to get any of my other clothes dirty. Um, but apparently that was immodest. It wasn't even a tank top. It was just like a, a V-neck undershirt that I would wear under my, my concert clothes. Um, so I got taken in to talk to the orchestra manager uh, because of that, saying it was immodest. And I guess I, I argued with her because I was kind of done with it at that point anyway. I realized you know immediately what this was and I, I was having fun with it. So I didn't want to quit immediately. But by that time, I had uh, married my wife and um, was planning on quitting soon anyway. So I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like a reason not to speak my mind, not about the religion. I, I kept relatively silent about that, um, but just being argumentative with her. And Lee Hongzhou even walked by the door and saw me gesticulating, trying to like defend my wearing the shirt. And then, like, immediately after that, like, later that day, they pulled me in. They're like, oh, we're, we're going to let you go. Okay, fair enough. So that was the end of my uh, career with Falun Gong, with Shen Yun. Um, fascinating thing. So he's banned from China, and I'm sure he works with uh, U.S. agencies in some capacity, Another interesting thing is that he he all he often talks about the old ones, old power. I forget what the phrase was, um, but just that there's this ancient ruling elite that he says they respect him because they're you know what he's able to do. Um, and if I could go back and and read all of the the books, um, there's all sorts of stuff to decipher there, but. Just thought I'd share that with you. Um, if you clicked on this because you are part of Falun Gong, uh, you know, you're a naive cultist who has been either brainwashed or you're just a foolish kind of new age person. It's not philosophically coherent. You don't know why you believe it. You're just trapped by charisma. And hey, that's what religious people typically do. I don't have a problem with it. Um, unless you're a kid being brought up into it, in which case, like, you should somebody should intervene a little bit. And I took very measured steps to, uh, to suggest um, some alternatives to a couple of the kids who I thought were smart enough. But as a general principle, if, if a religious person's faith is strong, even if they were brainwashed into it, uh, if their average or below average intelligence, don't even bother trying because you're going to do more harm than good. Um, religion helps people. Fallen Gong probably does help a lot of people. Still weird though, huh? Anyway, thank you for listening.